Namaste. The title of this session is Indian Worldview and its implications for management practice and research. Along with management practice, we will talk about pedagogical aspect of management as well. Flow of this session is as follows. First, we will discuss what is worldview. Next, we will talk about how management theory is affected by the worldview. Then, we will aim at unraveling the Indian worldview and we will touch upon predominantly three aspects, nature of man, relation between man and nature and wealth and wealth creation. In the last section, we will talk about implication for management practice and research of the Indian worldview. We will look at few aspects like ecocentric perspective, holistic approach, respect for authority as well as individual contribution, value of sharing, familial self which are predominantly the concepts arising out of Indian worldview, how there can be implication of these things on management education, research and practice. Let us discuss first what is worldview. So, first this term was used by Kant uh, in, the, in the German term called Waltensung that means a view used to describe one's total outlook on life on society and a set of interrelated assumptions about nature of the world. Then Caltco Rivera defined the world view as a way of describing the universe and life within it both in terms of what is and what ought to be. In addition to defining what goals can be sought in life, it also defines what goal should be pursued in life. World view is a framework of meaning and meaning making that profoundly informs our very understanding and enactment of reality. There are many similar constructs like philosophy of life, self and world construct, core culture, cultural orientation. These terms are being used as a substitute to the word of world view. It is important to distinguish between culture mindset and world view. Culture of a society comprises of the shared values, understandings, assumptions and goals that are learned from earlier generations, which is imposed by present members of a society and passed on to a succeeding generations. Whereas, mindsets are defined as the constellation of beliefs, preferences and practices that the people possess for maintaining continuity in the way they react and adapt to the changing environment. And world view which is already defined is one's outlook on life, society and a set of interrelated assumptions about the nature of the world. At this point of time, it is also useful to distinguish between beliefs and world view. Rokich gave a typology of the beliefs. It's, he says, that there are three types of beliefs, existential beliefs, evaluative beliefs and prescriptive beliefs. Existential beliefs are those which are capable of being tested true or false, whereas evaluative belief is about something which is judged as good or not good or bad. Prescriptive beliefs are the values values are about some means or end of action at just being desirable and undesirable. And that is why values are of two types as defined by Rukic. He says that these are of terminal values and instrumental values. Worldview statement may refer to beliefs of any of the three kinds. However, worldview statements are the beliefs, but all beliefs may not be worldview. So, worldview as Caltco Rivera defines are the beliefs regarding the underlying nature of reality, proper social relationship, guidelines for living and existence or non-existence of important entities. World view has central role in field of developmental psychology, sports psychology, general counseling and psychotherapy. Its importance in management is also being recognized in many leading journals expressed by many, many established and reputed management scholars. I would like to quote 
two of them, Ghoshal, late Professor Sumantra Ghoshal, in his famous paper titled Bad Management Theories Are Destroying Good Management Practices, says that by propagating ideologically inspired immoral theories, business schools have actively freed their students from any sense of moral responsibility. So, Ghoshal talks about the world view and amoral theories arising out of that world view and its implication on the moral responsibility. Giacalon and Thomson also talked about the world view being prescribed in the management education and he says that existing organization focused world view needs to be changed to society centric world view to make the learning effective in the field of ethics and social responsibility. These are just two quotes out of many which talk about the importance of which indicate the power of the world view being prescribed in the management theory and its impact on the pedagogy, on the learning outcomes, practices and eventually theory building. We in this session are going to talk about Indian world view. To understand the Indian world view, I have referred three great scholars. Number one, Dr. Sarupalli Radhakrishnan. Dr. Radhakrishnan, the great philosopher, he is universally recognized as modern India's greatest philosopher and interpreter of Indian thoughts. Then I refer writings of Professor S. Abid Hussain. He was the professor of philosophy and literature at Jamia Millia. He was awarded with Padma Bhushan. He was conferred with the Sahitya Academy Award for the book on national culture of India. Then I am going to refer work of Professor Hajim Nakamura. He was the professor of philosophy at Tokyo Imperial University. He was expert on Sanskrit and Pali. His translations of Indian philosophy in Japanese still considered the definitive translation to date against which later translations are measured. So, these are the three philosophers whose writing I am going to refer to understand and to decipher what is Indian world view. We are going to discuss now nature of man as defined in the Indian world view. So, in Indian world view, the man is not altogether separate and peculiar being. He is part of universal nature he is a whole or she is a whole carved out of nature continuum. So, in Indian tradition or Indian wisdom, the notion of Brahma, Brahma is not different from true self that is Atman. It is not an align to the self, perhaps the Brahma is the true self. Hussein also indicates there are two main characteristics of Indian mind. These characteristics are capacity for contemplation, which he says dominates all other mental powers. And second thing he talks about is capacity to see and apprehend unity in diversity. And that is essentially the characterizing feature of Indian world view. Nakamura used a very different method. S. Radhakrishnan looked at philosophical text wisdom traditional like Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita and from there he deciphered the world view. Dr. Abid Hussain looked at the Indian philosophy, the traditional wisdom text, but he also looked at the history and geography of this country to reach to a conclusion about the Indian culture and about the Indian mind. Nakamura different from other two scholars looked at the Buddhist text, which was translated from Pali to Sanskrit and Tibetan and Chinese. And the same text is translated bit differently. And in that difference of translation, Nakamura identifies the world view or the mind of that culture. And Nakamura also points out that unlike modern, which is predominantly western philosophy, the main point of discussion was I, whereas the Indian philosophy discusses so much about the self, where Atman 
is regarded as identical with the absolute, the ultimate ego and both are equally called Atman. Sometimes the latter is called Paramatman and former is called Jivatman. Beyond the plane of appearances, there is no other self and as a result of that, Nakamura says that Maitri, which means friendship and Karuna, which means Daya are the natural expression of this world view and revered greatly in the Indian culture. So, if we look at what is the Indian perspective about Vyakti, individual, point here is to be noted that the term for the human being is not individual, which means indivisible. The point is that term for a single human being is called Vyakti, Vyakti means that which is expressed. So, that which is ultimate as it is being expressed is human being in Indian culture. And what it says that the human self which is eternal in nature, which is not different from the ultimate self or Brahma is encapsulated by the five layers. For any religion in India, the ultimate goal of freedom is to recovery or realization of the true self. But what are the layers, what are the koshas which encapsulates the true self and these koshas are first Annamaya Kosha, the physical self. Second Kosha or the envelope is called Pranamaya Kosha. Third Kosha is called Manumaya Kosha, which is about emotions. Fourth Kosha is called Vijnanamaya Kosha or the sheath of rationality or sheath of thought. And fifth one is called Anandamaya Kosha, the sheath of bliss. The human pursuit is to go out of all the sheaths to realize its true self. So, in Indian traditional wisdom and Indian culture and Indian world view, finding God is not the ultimate aim. The finding, recognizing, experiencing the true self is the ultimate goal of the human life. Now, we will talk about what is how the relationship between man and nature are prescribed in the Indian world view. So, I will refer three major references, I will take three major references. First, basic elements as the constituent of the all manifestations of nature, equality at the metaphysical level as reflected in the Indian world view and a sukta or hymn about the earth given in the Artharvaveda. So, these three references we will describe one by one. Number one, the basic element which constitute all manifestations of nature are five. Indian worldview do not distinguish between living or non-living. Everything in the universe is full of life. Life is expressed in a more complex way in some other manifestation. Life is expressed in a very simple way in some other expression. That is the difference between the beings, but all beings are made up of five element. They, these are air, fire, water, ether and earth or bhumi. Uh, the sequence is that akash, the sky or ether is considered to be the most basic element. From there arises fire and vayu, the air. And so, Vayu has Agni as well as Akash. From these three, after these three ar arise water. So, water has all four Agni, Vayu and Akash and earth is the or Bhumi is the fifth element which has all four and its own distinguishing quality. So, five element are the constituents of all the natural manifestations. So, in that way Indian world view does not distinguishes at the fundamental level about a plant, stone, river, mountain or human being. And to recognize that oneness, there is one shlok worth uh, referring here, which says that vinayad vinaya sampannam brahmane gavihastini shuni chaiva 
Shwapake cha pandita samadarshana. In this shloka, the characteristics of a learned man is described and what, what is the characteristic of a learned man? He says that with knowledge comes humility and learned ones see with equal eye a brahman, a cow, an elephant or even a dog or an outcast. So, Radha Krishnan explains that the nature is the world of objectivization and distinction is there among minerals, plants, animals and men, but they all have an inner non-objective existence. And realizing this truth is the sign of knowledge and learned person in the Indian world view. Our third example is coming from uh, one eulogy or sukta called Prathvi sukta given in Atharvaveda. One of the hymns, one of the couplet of the Prathvi Sutta is that Yatte Madhyam Prathvi Yachya Nabhyam Yasta Urjas Tanva Sambhav Sambhav Bhuvu Tasu no Dhebhi Na Pavasya Mata Bhumi Putro Ham Prathivya Parjanya Pita Sa U Na Pi Parthu. That means salutation to the Mother Earth on your center. Madhyam Prathvi on your center, O Mother Earth, Yachanabhyam is your navel, Yasta Urjastam Samva Sambabhuvu is your navel from which the vital power emanates and spreads out. Tasuno Dhebhi Napavasva absorb us in that power and purity absorb us in that power and purify us. Mata Bhumi, O Bhumi Mata, O Mother Earth, Putroham Prathivya, I am the son of Mother, I am the, I am son of Mother Earth. And Parjanya is considered to be a rain god, is my father. May he fill, fill us with vital power in water. So, you can see that in Indian worldview, human being and Prathvi have a integrated understanding, have a integrated relationship. We, we originate from this Bhumi, we originate from the Prathvi. So, we are part of the nature as much as other elements of nature are, as much as other manifestations of nature are. And underlying this world view is what is evident we called unity and diversity. The subjective constant similar subjective substratum underlying the different manifestation, different objective manifestations of the nature. Now, we will talk about what is the work and wealth creation in Indian worldview. To understand the work and wealth creation in Indian worldview, we will take five major references. Number one, we will take the example of four Purushartha or as they are called in Mahabharata Chaturvarga. Then we will talk about one speech, one uh, method or one path of the four or three predominant paths of the self-realization called Karma Yoga. And within the Karma Yoga, we specifically look at the notion of Swadharma and Loka Sangra. Then we will talk about the Sri Shuktam to recognize the importance of wealth as expressed in the Indian worldview. Then we will talk about the notion of Ashtalakshmi and Shubhalav. So, first example is about the four pursuit of or major Purushartha of human life. So, in Indian worldview, what is, what is understood are the four major objectives of life. These are artha, dharma, kama and mocha. Dharma can be simply defined as righteousness, but it is in a more nuanced way, it is defined as that which holds and that which upholds and that which is to be upheld. Dharyet iti dharma and dharyati iti dharma, 
that which upholds and that which is to be upheld both are the meaning of dharma dharma is a dynamic moral ethical principle expressed in the indian world view that is the guiding force that is the axle on which arth and kama should be pursued in life arth simply means materialistic possessions and kama means consumption so materialistic possession and consumption should be guided by dharma is the essence of the four predominant pursuits and when this is practiced moksha or liberation is the natural outcome which is the fourth or ultimate pursuit of human life so you can look at in the chaturvarg that indian world view does not distinguishes or says that wealth is bad and only dharma is good material is bad only spiritual is good this kind of claim is not made in the indian world view in fact one hymn in ishopanishad says that those who think that materialistic things material world is the ultimate thing is the only reality they are in the darkness but those who think only subjective and spiritual world is the reality they are also equal darkness materialistic world and spiritual world are the distinctions of mind in life these are not distinguishable they constitute the one they constitute the two phases of the same reality that's why one has to be referred in pursuit of other and that is the reflection of the indian world view about wealth and importance of consumption and possessions in human life